So to the pay tribute to all of you that actually came here on time, we will start. And this, this uh, plenary will actually, this kind of the first of the two plenaries, well, uh, the row of plenaries will actually be about the topic of the conference this year, sharing innovation across sectors. And we will have many, many, many sectors presented uh, today, uh, up to 22, isn't it? 22 sectors will be presented and six countries. So, so stay awake and we will have a first presentations and then all the Q&A and the discussion will be saved for the panel in the end. So let us start with, uh, with Prosper, talking about the cross-sector use cases, uh, key responses to, uh, to assess, to measure the SDGs. And then we will continue with Malawi, with the Ministry of Agriculture. Then we'll continue with Jörn, talking about stenosis in DRC. Then we will end up with uh, John or Sam on under or Sam. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, talking about climate health and also civil registry from Lao. Okay. Okay. Um, good morning. Okay. There is still more coffee out there, so if we could we could pick some coffee and and come with it. Yeah. So uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the final day. Um, a great opportunity for us to be sharing with you. Um, uh the sharings and the cross sectors that we're talking about so i'm here um just putting on big shoes for three countries again this already shows the sharing we already have that i'm able to present all the three use cases in the three countries uh the sharing has already started happening so uh, i'll be sharing the the different cross sector implementations in the different countries uh, and when we talk about cross sector, we're talking about more than one government, more than one ministry, more than one institution uh, in a country. So most of us have been talking about health, 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 health. Education came in last year, but now we're talking about you know all these so many that I'm going to share. So this is a compilation of a summaries from the two powerful implementations that have really driven DHIS too crazy, as we shall share, but also has uh, produced some good insight uh, to what we can be able to do in terms of uh, uh, improving the DHIS2 to monitor and have it as a digital public good. So when we talk about cross sector, this is the mess that we are in. Uh, you know, you talk about health, you talk about environment, you talk about climate health, you talk about education, you talk about um, uh, finance, you talk about sports, all these so many uh, sectors is what we're looking at. So a little piece of this has been picked in, Ug in Uganda and in uh, Rwanda and in Ethiopia. And we're going to share with you to see how the, uh, the DHIS2 is really helping in terms of bringing the data together for triangulation and being able to monitor uh, the government programs. So uh, DHIS2 is in, in the center of this, uh, getting all this data, exchanging the data, managing the data, visualizing the data in, 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 in these different sectors. So um, these are the different three use cases. And again, there could be more. Uh, we, 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 we didn't go out to, to look for many, but these are the three use cases that we already know right now that have been shared uh, in the different parallel sessions. Uh, we, we look at Ethiopia um, uh, at a level of a district uh, cross-sector implementation and really um, using the basis of DHIS2 to, to drive this uh, implementation. So they are looking to see and they have been uh, able to use the DHIS2 for health and build on other sectors like agriculture and, and, and the rest as we, as we shall see, to be able to monitor the key uh, performing indicators for what they have as a transformation agenda, trying to be able to improve um, the social welfare of the different districts. Uh, and so they are bringing all these two sectors, to, to these three or four sectors to be able to look at data uh, uh, transited together. Then we move to Rwanda, where uh, it's uh, looking at more on the local government um, that could also be below the district and uh, uh, 
really looking at how you can be able to um, monitor accountability across the different um, the local governments, uh, even to the grassroots of where they have the lowest, they are, they are operating at the lowest political um, uh, entity to be able to monitor innovation. So here you have uh, targets being set by the different governments uh, with funds allocated, and then moving from village to village to be able to monitor these indicators. So you find a mix of, um, of implementations where uh, villages or local government have different uh, targets and set of, of indicators that you are monitoring. And we'll also be able to see how this is, 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 is implemented especially how DHIS2 is really supporting this kind of implementation. Moving from the paper-based kind of monitoring to now an electronic monitoring for a local government. Then we come to Uganda, which has all the mixes from the national level also up to the, also the grassroots, where are we monitoring the national development plan? So governments all said they have their national development plans. So for us, we are on plan, plan three, which is towards the vision 2040. Uh, and here um, uh, we are looking at all the sectors actually in the country, um, as, as I shared in the previous slide, and uh, also uh, a new initiative which is also looking at the parish development model, where the different parishes are given grants and they're supposed to use them, and then we're able to monitor what happens. So this is how the DHIS now comes into the mix of all these things, and as, and as we talk, there are quite a number of systems as we all know in the different governments. So we have to exchange data between them, like if we miss the, fam the finance system, so that has to be you know, exchanged from those systems. So what motivated us to really use DHIS2 uh, in, this, in these three countries? And again, even more that are coming. So uh, for most of this uh, implementation, I may not want to talk about how much it, has, it had costed them to be able to decide whether to go for DHIS2, but uh, a lot of our local governments and our governments have been depending on, ve on vendor uh, systems, uh, which have been quite expensive. Um, in one of the countries, uh, the, the last vendor before DHIS2 uh, I don't use all the funds to do requirements gathering and they stopped there. So the DHIS took up the requirements gathering and the requirements gathered and they were able to use it. So we find a lot of uh, uh, challenges in terms of how much it has been costing the governments uh, to be able to develop these systems, maintain them with expatriates. Most of them are expatriate they are driven. Do the upgrades, uh, we've seen somewhere where people have to be thrown into the country to just adjust one data element. Uh, and also sometimes functionality, especially around uh, visualization, that has also been one of the biggest motivators of the DHIS2. Then of course, uh, uh, the local expertise that are in the country uh, that have been able to demonstrate the functionality, the capabilities, the sustainability model of DHIS2. We have of course our HISP groups um, that have been uh, in the, in, this, in the three countries, but also most importantly, the teams that we have been able to train over time. I think when you look at our academy training uh, database, we are almost now over 10,000 or something like that. And these people have all been trained in the use of DHIS2 and they're all you know, out in the countries there. Then of course, um, uh, thanks to the ministries of health in these countries that have really implemented DHIS2 for over 10 years, so a government looking at an implementation which has been stable for 10 years uh, really gives them the, the confidence to go for this solution. Then of course, the flexibility around DHIS2 that you can be able to even add on top scripts, uh, apps, plugins uh, to support extra functionality. Because when you get to these um, uh, sectors, we find quite uh, a, a, a different requirements that are not supported by the core. Then of course also the track record in health as I've shared, but most importantly around COVID. The COVID um, implementations in these countries really drove the cross sector uh, implementation. So in this, uh, in, the, in the instances that we are running, in the implementation that we are running for COVID, we just realized that um, we were able to bring the different sectors for Uganda, we, we, we talk about education and health. We, for Rwanda, we talk about you know, the immigration and all these other sectors. So these have also been one of the key and also having also these other 
extension that we had already started, uh, the education as we've talked about, the judiciary in Uganda, uh, monitoring how many cases have been, or been um, ad addressed. The social protection and agriculture in Malawi, as, as you've shared, and environment, environment and, um, and minerals in, uh, in, in Rwanda. So this has also been able to give the confidence of the governments that these systems can be able to work in, in, the, in, in, the, in the government. So um, in terms of progress, I just, just give a snapshot. Um, uh, the implementations are up and running. Uh, for Ethiopia, they have been able to customize this on top of the DHIS two for education, added those different sectors, and they're able to translate the data, been able to pilot, and now moving to more of the districts, what they call their where it does. For Rwanda, um, they never pilot, but this one they did some pilots, but the pilot here is really to inform uh, the next implementation. So much as it, they talk about a pilot, it is just a whole you know, administrative unit with all the different levels. And this is just being used to be able to uh, implement in the next. As I shared for Rwanda, they have different indicators almost for a different uh, sub, sub unit as they move from one province to another province. For Uganda, uh, the configuration has also been completed for all the uh, NDP target indicators, over 5,000 indicators into the system because we're looking at all the sectors. And uh, the targets, because they have been, they, they've been able to set the targets for each year until 2040, all the targets have been put in the system. And then for the previous two financial years that has been uploaded, and now the rollout and the training is ongoing in all these uh, different sectors. And, uh, and, and then for Uganda, um, uh, because they want this to be, you'll see we're going up 2040. So for us to be able to sustain it, um, uh, there is an initiation of an MOU between his and the office of the, of the prime minister to be able to support this uh, as, as we keep monitoring the, the progress. Now, of course, there are challenges, uh, not so many though, uh, uh, just for them for now. Uh, the challenge we, we faced a little bit is um, the standardization of indicators. As we know from health, you've had this one HMI tool. It's the same everywhere you go, but here you find that the indicators probably could even be the same, defined different from one, from one, sector, from, from one implementation site to another implementation site. So you'll find that we have quite a lot of multiple data elements, data, data, data sets, indicators. That's why they become so many because sometimes they slightly change as you move. But again, DHIS2 with its robustness, we are able to uh, cater for that. That the mitigations are what is in blue. Then the, there are some of the unique uh, uh, functionalities and features that the, the governments may want uh, in terms of security, in terms of visualization, in terms of data capture. But we've been able to solve this by just adding a few apps on, on top of DHIS2 that could be you know, soon um, implemented in the core. Then insufficient funds for, uh, for implementation. Uh, again, as you see, this is talking about more than one sector. We've been struggling with health alone, but now if you're going to train the whole country, all the ministries and so on, it becomes quite challenging and it requires a lot of budget. So we've been trying to do a lot of online training, uh, thanks to COVID for teaching us that. And we've also been developing user guides, which are very simple to use. And then also the e-learning e platforms. Moodle has also been very key in this. We've really been able to do this. And then also the, the YouTube videos that have been shared with these ministries for them to be able to, to get the training. Then interoperability with, other, with multiple systems, some of which are very sensitive uh, in terms of data sharing. You talk about, uh, you know, this, this ministry sharing their budget with the other one, they may not be able to want to, to look at that. So some of the, the things we've been able to do is just, you know, sometimes we export and import with Excel. Uh, lessons learned, uh, lastly, um, um, uh, this is a quote from Lars. I think that was in 2011, where I said, everything is possible in DHIS2. And I took that, you know, as a, as a quote in the Bible, and we've been using it, and that's why we've been able to really push DHIS2 beyond. So with DHIS2, everything is possible. I think um, the great pr platform that we have here in terms of what you can be able to add and how you can be able to switch it to turn it around 
has been one of the you know lessons learned where you can have apps on top of it we can have script, scripts we can have plugins data triangulation very key you know imagine when you're sitting and you're able to look at all the different sectors like when it comes to health you want to look at agriculture how it contributes to your nutrition programs and um, and uh, education how it contributes to your immunization programs then again, this has also, you know, sparked up a lot of interest. Uh, we already have Gambia and Malawi on knocking on the door. Before even we finish these implementations, uh, uh, Gambia is already now up in the, uh, the, the, actually the demo was already set up yesterday, prototype to be shared with the government to be able to look at that. Institutionalization is also very key. Uh, we really need to build the capacity within the institute, like for now for the government, this is a big undertaking. So MOUs are important, and then establishing formal working environments uh, within the, the MOUs that we're talking about. Uh, just a quick snapshot of what you can be able to visualize. This could be all the different indicators that you can bring on the dashboard. Uh, here you can have a scorecard looking at your different ministries and quickly look out for the reds. This is one of the beautiful uh, dashboard that you will find in the president's office, you know, looking at, you know, uh, what how the sector is performing in the different um, uh, um, the directives uh, for the manifesto they are running. And then lastly, in terms of appreciation, we really want to thank the governments that have been able to participate with us in this, the government of Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Uganda for really taking this bold step. And I think they are not regretting as we, as we talked to them. We had uh, a, a nice presentation from Uganda and, and, and Rwanda and Ethiopia the other day. The national um, and the regional sub, uh, implementation units that we have in, this, in these countries, um, the districts, ministries, and all that, the development partners that have funded this, the uh, European Union has been funding Uganda and um, is now funding the, the implementation in Gambia. Then the HISP groups that have taken this work and uh, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Uganda, and also the UIO teams that we've been all uh, you know, disturbing and telling them, you know, we need this. And when they say that we can't do it, we say, okay, the HIS can do everything, so we shall be able to fix it. Thank you very much. And um... thank you so much, uh, Prosper. I forgot to say that Prosper is then representing his Uganda, but you all know that, I think. So let us Welcome, uh, Jennifer uh, Nkosi from Ministry of Agriculture of Malawi, talking about the NAMIS project. We heard a bit about the NAMIS project last year as well. We even have a PhD student that will start up uh, working on this um, um, project from Malawi, from the same team, coming to Oslo in, in August. And also I have to mention that these uh, um, projects that um, uh, Prosper was presented also have PhD students that are studying because we really think this is kind of super interesting and I think it's spot on for the sharing on innovation across sector. It's a good example. So over to you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me and uh, to share what we are doing. Uh, uh, how we are using the DHIS2 uh, in the uh, agriculture sector, in the Ministry of Agriculture uh, in Malawi. So my name is uh, Jen Fankosi. I'm an economist and also I'm the one who is coordinating uh, the NAMI system uh, in the ministry. So let me begin with by saying that I have a friend, uh, a colleague, who usually comes uh, to my office and say, uh, Jennifer, um, I love NAMI system. I love uh, the functionalities of the DHIS2 platform, uh, how I'm able to utilize it at district level. So that's why I'm here uh, to share with you uh, why we love uh, NAMIS and why we think the DHIS2, it's a good platform uh, to utilize uh, in uh, different sectors, uh, including mm -hmm. agriculture. So NAMIS, uh, our vision is that it's a one-stop uh, system uh, where you find uh, different uh, data sources, different data sets uh, to do with uh, climate, uh, data to do with uh, marketing, production, and uh, the system we are collecting data at uh, lower level 
uh, by the extension workers are the ones who are collecting data. And uh, the data is either collected aggregate data or it's um, individual level data. In this uh, system, we are making sure that under the day, it's uh, being utilized by different stakeholders uh, in the ministry, including the farmers as well, including the academia, the research institution. So at the end of that, uh, we also are developing a public portal where we want to share some of the analytics, uh, the reports that will be generating uh, through the system. So just a quick update of uh, what we have achieved in terms of the implementation. So we have uh, rolled out 12 modules uh, out of the 18. And I know that uh, as we be going in the future, the 18 modules is going to increase uh, based on the needs of uh, different users and stakeholders. But currently right now we are 12 modules. And uh, one of the modules that has gained momentum in our ministry, it's the household registration. And as of now, uh, we have um, registered over 807,000 households. And uh, this system we're implementing in uh, 12 out of uh, 28 uh, districts. And uh, 1,622 devices, uh, translating to the number of uh, staff that were trained and that are collecting uh, uh, the acquired data in the system. So this is just a snapshot of the household registration, uh, as I indicated. It's one of uh, the modules uh, that uh, the ministry and even the donors uh, in our sector are interested uh, because we are able uh, to collect detailed information to do with the household demographics, the enterprises, the households are involved, uh, even the support that they are able to receive from NGOs and uh, support from also from government projects. And this is assisting us in terms of of uh, targeting and uh, uh, programming uh, different uh, projects based on the information uh, that we are collecting at household level. And also from this household registration, uh, we have uh, learned more in terms of the capability of the DHIS2 platform uh, because we have been able to develop customized application or on, to on, in the, on top of the DHIS2 uh, to facilitate in terms of um, uh, sampling of the households and those sampled households, allowing them to uh, different uh, programs, uh, for example, uh, food situation assessment that we do uh, biweekly and also uh, production estimates uh, that we collect every quarter and that is an, an annual uh, exercise. So my presentation today will focus on the key modules um, uh, what we are doing and what we want to do moving forward. Uh, we have three modules. We have the meteorology, uh, looking at uh, weather and climate data. We have the farm organization, uh, household registration. It's one of that. It's, it's in one of the modules. It's one of it. Uh, we have a uh, lead farmer. Uh, these are the ones, uh, the farmers that work with extension workers in delivery of extension messages, and also a module to do with animal health and livestock. Here we are looking at a disease outbreak and a livestock production estimates and other data information that we are collecting in the three modules. So to start with the weather and climate efforts uh, that we have uh, started under uh, NAMIS, uh, we want to have a better uh, weather data collection at community level, that's our vision. Uh, currently we are just collecting uh, rainfall data, but we want to go more and be able to collect other weather parameters, including uh, temperature and humidity. Also, our vision is that based on the information that we are collecting on weather and climate uh, should guide us uh, on farming practices and pest and uh, pest disease uh, management and other uh, resource allocations uh, from national level to household level. And also are looking at combined analytics, uh, how we can link weather with crop uh, animal nutrition uh, data sets, because I know that uh, weather has a direct effect on crop animal and nutritional aspects. Um, yeah. Then also we are looking at uh, linking uh, the climate efforts uh, that we have through extensional services and the model of our farmers uh, that we are uh, 
legislating the lead farmers and the farmer feed skills. So what we want is that we collect uh, this climate data, we analyze it, uh, we develop uh, extension services, uh, extension messages based on the climate products and that we have developed. And for that, we will be share uh, to uh, the farmers. So that will help us in documentation of the best practices uh, based on the information uh, that we are collecting on the weather and climate data and also support uh, mentorship uh, efforts. So the tools and the work uh, that we have done in the numbers. So on uh, weather and climate data, we have uh, configured 379 weather stations as part of the reporting hierarchy. And this is being collected at community level. So we have a data at lowest point as possible. And uh, climate efforts through extension services, we have currently registered 6,603 6, lead farmers and 85 farm, farmer food schools. And um, since the activity of the registration is ongoing, uh, we expect uh, that uh, the number of uh, these lead farmers and the farmer feed schools it's going to increase. So, as I said earlier, these uh, the lead farmers and the farmer feed schools were using them as a model. They are used in dissemination of agricultural technologies and uh, messages, and also we are able to monitor and map the interventions that are being implemented by the lead farmers and the farmer food school. So, this is just a snapshot of. Uh, some of the analytics, the visualizations uh, that we are generating uh, using the NAMA system, uh, the rainfall uh, that we collected uh, last season and this season. And also, this is also a, a visualization uh, showing uh, the number of lead farmers uh, that we have registered um, per district. And the analysis can even go to the lowest point of uh, data collection. So we can be able to know that uh, in this specific area, we have this number of lead farmers. So that will help us in terms of better uh, programming and uh, targeting. And uh, the other modules uh, that also we have in the NAMI system, it's uh, the livestock and uh, the animal health. So, as I said, uh, the, on, in this module, we are looking at the production aspect, and also we are looking at uh, uh, the animal health aspect in terms of the disease outbreak. And in terms of the, we have currently started with the production, um, uh, production, collecting of uh, production of uh, uh, different uh, livestock. And um, under this uh, uh, this questionnaire, we're also able to collect some different uh, dynamics of uh, uh, different uh, livestock that we uh, yeah, that we keep in our communities. So we are able also to know uh, in terms of how many uh, dogs have died due to rabies, how many people have been uh, bitten by uh, dogs. So it's uh, one of the uh, parameters that we are uh, uh, able to track under the production questionnaire, but we have a set of uh, data sets that go into details in terms of uh, animal uh, disease outbreak. So that's where we are going uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of further configuration of uh, the animal disease. Uh, and more health uh, in terms of monitoring and surveil uh, surveillance of the uh, and more health. Yeah. So we also work with the Ministry of Health uh, in uh, different portfolios, whether to do with uh, nutrition, uh, whether to do with uh, disease outbreak uh, in terms of uh, zoonotic diseases. So we also have identified opportunities uh, for community level one health uh, efforts. Uh, so we are looking at uh, us uh, as a ministry being able to provide uh, climatic uh, data to uh, the Minister of Health and for them to be able to utilize that information that we collect by the extension workers uh, for their own uh, systems. And also we are looking at guiding efforts on how we can uh, link between climate uh, change food production that affects uh, human nutrition and health 
And also we have the one healthy surveillance that uh, as a ministry, we are part of uh, uh, the team uh, that we do work together in terms of surveillance of uh, zoonotic diseases. So we are looking at cross uh, sector analysis of uh, disease patterns uh, using uh, the system. And also on the human health and uh, labor availability, uh, we're also looking at uh, cross sector analysis of disease burden impact on agricultural labor availability that if a person is malnutritioned, that will also affect in terms of uh, productivity in the agriculture sector because of uh, labor availability. So we want to create a synergy where we can work together to have a one platform uh, where we can uh, be collecting uh, different informations and be able to utilize in our own respective uh, sectors. So what are the new and uh, future efforts uh, that we have started and also we envisioned uh, moving forward? Um, we want to start importing a 10 year in for data. We have uh, managed to gather uh, historical data for 10 years on rent for data, but also that's one of the challenges that we are currently facing uh, because we are migrating from paper-based to electronic. So to gather the, the paper-based uh, historical data has been a challenge. And also we are in partnership with the University of Malawi's Center for Resilience at the Food System. Here we are looking at uh, the center providing capacity development uh, for our staff in the ministry in terms of how we can further develop uh, the system and also utilization of the system. And also we are looking at development of uh, automated instruments for additional weather parameters as we already, as we already indicated, we are just focusing on the uh, rainfall data currently. In collaboration with the University of Oslo, as already indicated by Kristen, they have identified um, a PhD student that would, would do research on the NAMIS system. And also collaboration uh, with the Ministry of Health on common areas of efforts at community level uh, using the One Health platform uh, together with the NAMIS system. Lastly, um, we cannot forget uh, the ones uh, that they are mandated to generate uh, climate information. Uh, we work together. Uh, so. We want uh, to have, uh, we want the department to be able to disseminate uh, more customized and actionable climate products to the farmers. Because currently, the climate products that they are producing it's at high level, at national level. But we want to find a way of how we can uh, the analysis should go as low as to the community level when they are developing their climate products. And lastly. Um, we want uh, NAMIS not to be a system only that generates data, but we want also this system to benefit the farmers who we are getting the information. So we want uh, this system where, but when you collect that information, we should be able to send back the feedback in terms of give, giving them the update, generating extension messages, coming up with uh, extension technologies on how they can benefit uh, in their livelihood in terms of agriculture production and productivity. So it want to be a one way, but it has to be a two way whereby they give us the information, we utilize it and we give them uh, back and they benefit from the system. Thank you very much. Super, Jennifer. Very, very interesting and on the spot uh, presentation for this session. And this is a good uh, transition over to Euron that will talk more about animal health. It was introduced here and we will go more into depth of the zoonosis for the DRC. Yeah. Yeah. And Kenya, sorry, sorry, sorry. So then we have seven countries, more countries. <laughs> And we will have, uh, so so write down your questions. If, uh, you know, we save it for, for the time of the panel to discuss uh, or, and to ask questions. And I have many of them to Jennifer, but we can also and use I'll the coffee next break. One here. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, about to talk about uh, uh, One Health and the One Health approach, but we do focus on, on animal health, in fact, because uh, uh, if we want to achieve something on the one health side, we need to also uh, maybe put more emphasis on the animal health because 
that's kind of the little brother in the terms of uh, uh, health information system. So we start by uh, comparing the domains of uh, animal health with the human health uh, surveillance. So to see what are the differences, because if you just take the approach from human health and try to implement it in animal health, it doesn't necessarily uh, pay off uh, very well. So we are looking into lessons from Kenya, and we have a pilot project uh, working in DRC, which we then try to uh, to, to, to apply the learnings uh, to. So first then, uh, why this uh, animal health surveillance uh, is important? And uh, well, yes, uh, even though there are some some uh, questions around COVID, we can say that uh, anyway that uh, it's kind of the transmission between animals and humans that that is the focus. We have more obvious things like uh, anthrax, Rift Valley fever, monkeypox, and talking about uh, DRC, Ebola, of course, is uh, an important. Uh, a reason for looking at uh, early warning and, and this health security. So the general uh, approach is then to integrate animal and human health surveillance into a one health approach. And the reason why we want to focus a bit on, on animal health, because that is the poorest developed a partner in, in this this uh, partnership. Lesson from uh, Kenya. They have a system with the paper and and uh, electronic uh, uh, reporting, uh, surveillance uh, data, and uh, surveillance is very much about uh, a little interesting for us to try to fight against all the zeros in in the general uh, HIS uh, HMIS because here is a kind of a, compulsory zero reporting. They want to see whether a disease is not present. That's kind of a very important part of the disease surveillance in, in, in this uh, system. And the end users of the system, that's uh, veterinarian officers and users. They are at farms, slaughterhouses, and they're using uh, mobile data, data for, for data entry. So the digital system has the potential to give uh, real-time real -time data. But the problem is that it's not well, it's well implemented, but it's not well functioning. And we will look into why, because this is leading to uh, serious underreporting and gaps in reporting. So discussing with, with the people involved in, in this uh, system and possible uh, causes for this uh, Poor performance, suboptimal performance is, of course, that uh, maybe particularly in, in, in Kenya, then you have uh, uh, complexities between the wild animals, wildlife, and, and uh, domestic animals. And uh, the reporting across and within is, is, is not uh, is, it's causing problems. And uh, then uh, you also see what we have also learned to, to uh, observe a lot uh, in uh, the more uh, well-known HMIS reporting, that is the poor reporting structures. If no data reported, then we get no complaints as people are saying, and you can stop reporting and you hear nothing that from, from, from the level above you. So it's a passive reporting is, is, a, is a general problem. And uh, maybe because it's about animals and it's maybe so not so focused on, on say, the economic aspects of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the farms and, and, and uh, cattle farming, for example, there's no urgence around reporting. So it's not what they say, not so very compulsory to report. And that is then, of course, re re resulting in uh, uh, underreporting. And it's also poor connection with the uh, human health. And uh, you see that human health is more concerned with, with uh, zoonotic diseases than the veterinarian and animal health are. 
maybe that is uh, that is uh, an important thing to address because of course uh, uh, farmers animal health they are more interested in the economy of things than necessarily to focus on the few uh, diseases that can can uh, are transmittable to, to humans and also what they complain a bit is that uh, one health is uh, very often understood that human health people trying to educate the, the kind of the animal health people so that's some kind of uh, a disagreement between the between the between the the camps so these are then lessons from from kenya and then we move to to uh, drc and see how we can apply these lessons to strengthen uh, in particular the animal side of things in 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 uh, in drc so of course uh, drc is known as a hotspot for for uh, zoonotic diseases and a great concern when it comes to kind of uh, disease surveillance and uh, health security we have ebola and then just now we have mon uh, monkeypox from from drc and uh, DRC has used this uh, global FRO uh, system for some time. That's uh, Impress uh, is one, and uh, this is about reporting to FRO at the at the headquarters. But based on on uh, rabies uh, projects in one uh, province, Congo Central, in uh, in uh, DRC, they used DHIS, but at a at a, a global instance and then they wanted to to, to make it uh, local and uh, we started to work with them and to expand from rabies to more general uh, animal health surveillance and when it comes to the other part and in a one health approach the minister of health in drc have used dhs2 since 2015. so we started then uh, last year uh, late in the year with the, the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Livestock and Fisheries in, 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 in this, uh, this uh, Congo Central, and a university in Kinshasa, the Pedagogic uh, University of Kinshasa. And then we worked on putting up a local instance in, uh, for, for this province on animal health and to having as an object, objective to to uh, work on an integrated uh, uh, dashboard on zoonotic diseases with the, with the human health and animal health. So the project then customized uh, DHIS for, for, for the animal health surveillance, the pilot, uh, and to make it interoperable with the, with the what is the guard that was the, the, the rabies uh, system. And uh, so that it, you don't have to enter the data twice and to make uh, make the system interoperable with the FIO system and of course also to work on this integrated dashboard with with the general HMIS in in DRC or uh, challenges uh, in in uh, DRC when it comes to this uh, animal health uh, part of course uh, also, in particular, maybe in the DRC, the information system uh, in animal health sector is much less structured than the human health, uh, because the human health uh, or the general HMIS and, and uh, HIS is established with a basis in the health facilities and more or less uh, dedicated uh, HIS officers who are responsible for data reporting, et cetera, but you don't have anything like that in the human health. If you look beyond the, the last administrative structure, you have, you have farms, you have people, and that is, of course, uh, uh, a source for, 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 uh, for some, some challenges. And of course, you do, in the DRC, you don't have many veterinarians. You have trained animal health uh, surveillance officers that are responsible for so-called sectors come back to that. And uh, 
the problem is, of course, that uh, that uh, the structure of reporting, the hierarchy, as we call it in the DHS uh, to lingo, is different between the two sectors. So it's difficult to correlate data. So you need to manage multiple hierarchies to continue in the DHS2 lingo. So uh, that is a challenge. And the paper-based system and the computer-based system are not well developed. And uh, also there's less stakeholders, including donors, etc., that are interested in, in the animal health as compared with the human health. If you look at the structure between human health, you have the, the on the human health uh, hierarchy as the reporting structure and, and hierarchy, you have the, the, the provincial central, uh, you have the province, you have something they call it zone de santé, uh, which is a bit like a district, and you have uh, air de santé, and at the base you have uh formation san uh, sanitaire or that's the facility you have the facilities and then up to the air and to the zone the santé and to the province and if you compare with with the with the, the animal health hierarchy you have territoire which is um either many territories in one zone de santé or one to one or or, or even the opposite and that makes things uh, things uh, complicated and the same between the sector and, and the air something. So that is the uh, complexity. Yeah. Okay, implementation. Actually, it's uh, been working since, uh, since uh, last year and they have uh, supervision starting with training and supervision every, every, every quarter that is still working. <laughs> Of course, depending on, on funding, how this is uh, continuing. Here we have a screenshot of uh, One Health Notification Dashboard, where we have mon uh, monkeypox, rabies, African swine fever, uh, among others. So the system is working and collecting data. If you look at the way, way forward, uh, important to test out generally this uh, aggregate health reporting. What is something we have found out is very important is to make the system more generally useful for the agriculture sector, for the for the animal health sector, and to include also other ME indicators that might be important and increase the usability for, for those who are interested in the animal health so that you get a stronger animal health system in order to integrate it well with the, with the human health. So include more and more uh, make information output for multiple stakeholders, farmers, local government, traditional structures, etc. is is important, and to collaborate with the with the human health on the zoonotic uh, dashboards that's uh, obvious, and work on including integrating climate data, environmental data, and thereby to expand the one health approach and make it more uh, vibrant to put it that way because. Animal health is, I mean, maybe more, uh, uh, more. Uh, I mean, the climate and environment, etc., maybe more directly have more direct impact on on animal health than 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 most other areas. So that is important to to work on it, expanding the one health approach. Thank you, Jan. Super, super interesting, and uh, I hope we will have time in the panel, uh, depending on the, on John's uh, time consuming. But uh, very, very interesting to expand our area of health, that also uh, the importance of animal health in in the whole One Health concept. So that's very interesting. So now uh, John will uh, go from Africa to Asia and uh, talk about uh, two initiatives in in Laos, uh, both the climate health. Uh, initiative um, as well as uh, as civil registry thanks so. thanks christine so i will not take a long time i will just try to finish as much as, as soon as possible so that like we can have more discussion not too fast though. too fast okay 10 minutes so um, 
I just want to, uh, my name is John Lewis from uh, His Vietnam, a part of His Asia Hub and part of University of Oslo. Uh, been uh, working with DHIS2 for quite some time. I just want to give a bit of background about Lao. So Lao, we first started in um, 2013 and now it's been 10 years. We just recently celebrated our 10 years implementation of DHIS2 in Lao. Uh, we started with An and with all the people um, on establishing DHIS2 core team. Um, made sure like all the people are there, integrated with the different programs, started slowly building the, the digital health strategy, HIA strategy and e-health strategy in, in 2014 and 15. And then in 2016 was building the provincial core team, district core teams and other things. And also tried to include different programs like EPI, um, NCLE and other things. And then like in 2020 onwards, it was more about how do we integrate with other different ministries and other include all the other data, which is essential for health information system. Um, this is just a few slides, like what is there inside DHIS2 and what is there in outside in the country and how the data can be linked or work together in using a public dashboard or using internal mechanism and other things. I'm not going to, to give all the description about how, what we're trying to do, but focusing on um, enhancing the health system resilient on building the, the early warning system for climate sensitive data. So this is something which um, WHO um, allow along with um, this surveillance team and with the Ministry of Health and with, uh, with the climate data, we've been trying to, to work together. Uh, first thing is to impact on the climate change. The climate change vulnerabilities to like have the, the climate sensitive uh, diseases. Uh, Lao actually is a landlocked country next to Vietnam and it has a long river and all things. And it's a, it's a um, border between Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, uh, Myanmar um, and Thailand. Um, so now what's happening, like we are just seeing also the climate change in Oslo. We never had so good uh, weather. Usually when we just say summer, we have like, okay, 48 hours of summer. So now we have like four, or at least like four weeks of uh, really hot uh, weather. Uh, same, it's happening in, in Lao. It's rainy season are getting shorter and more intense. So that's related to the floods and more frequently the, the large dengue outbreak. So we're just like giving what's happening based on the climate. And also the drier season is getting longer or more warmer. It was 42 degrees, which was reported just a few weeks back in Lao. So it is affecting the, um, the agriculture, the food security, the rural population. And it also has very close to relations between the, the waterborne diseases in the dry season, which accounts for 11% of death among children under five. So the health worker already know that there is a direct correlation between uh, climate change and the health. But like what we can try to do, how do we build that one in a routine health reform system? Or how we can try to help them up? So the first thing like we worked with NCLE program to strengthen the disease surveillance data in DHRs too. They've been using quite well. So they started with, uh, with their Excel sheet and then they saw the potential of DHRs too. They've been using it. They're also now been um, using the not only the event-based uh, surveillance, but also indicate-based surveillance. Um, and then like what we did um, is to host, we went to the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and Environment, got all the climate data, put it into DHIS2, uh, both the min and max, the, the, and also the average rainfall um, in DHIS2 itself. And then we worked with um, the University of Gothenburg on um, uh, early warning um, uh, system, which combines the, um, the data from the climate and the rainfall and predicts when can it uh, predicts the, the outbreak in both in diarrhea and dengue. So that's the model we've been trying to work on. And our colleague around here, Jason Pickering, is working very closely how this tool can be useful, not only for the lab, but as a generic tool, which can be used in any DHR instance. So this is what has been happening right now. And we've been trying to working on this automatic data exchange between DHIS2 and Yvonne, and also have a very strong linkages between Ministry of Health Resources and uh, Environment. So this is just um, a few things like how it works. Um, 
here like we dhs2 is collecting daily in the event base the this is surveillance data and we also combine to the weekly the rainfall and the things are the daily data which we are also putting that putting it down but we are analyzing only by weekly basis uh, in lao there are not so many weather stations we have weather station but like in four or six different places uh, in the, the whole country the country is uh, of 18 um, provinces and then we are making the the combining the data and i'll just see and then based on that one we get trying to get the, the response out so this is the the what we are planning right now we have just like integrated between dhs2 and the evo in a semi automatic way where we push the data to e1 system and e1 system gives the output and then we put the, the e1's data back into dhs2 but we want to try to make this one automatic so that like it can be used uh, not only by the higher level but at least at the province level people and district level people so this is just an example of combining uh, the the diarrhea data in one of the place in Urumsai with uh, the rainfall and temperature so over the last um, few years uh, same thing with the rainfall and things uh, with, with the dengue and this was the like one of the things like this is not the district but like the e1 system causes such a district but like these are all the provinces in Laos we have 18 provinces so all the different things and then the, this where the all the different accuracy and based on the things what they've been trying to predict the positive predict value and negative predict value and based on that one they've been trying to do same thing for um for e1 for the all the things you just see like we didn't have some of the data we are missing for some of the provinces so again um so these are the few of the things output what we've been trying to to produce so how this will help um if we know the outbreak based on the climate we can try to prepare a bit more uh, better or as i say much more better um with the, like the diarrhea outbreak and all the things so we can have the or stocks and all the things in in a particular area prepare the health worker which they already know uh that there there will be because it's um they know that okay the climate change is happening but like we know there will be diarrhea things but we don't have sufficient drugs or the equipment or the things so they can try to deal with that one and also educate people when they go out like okay you have to drink more water and all these things and so that can be the the few of the other place the second topic which which i'm going to talk very quickly is about how what all the different things what we did to integrate between um, civil registration system and dhrs uh dhrs started long time civil registration system which is or we call e crvs uh, they used a software called hera which they just started um last year end of last year and this year um to um, to do the all the registration and everything but the ministry of health had all the other data uh, ministry of health did a um, survey um the whole survey by the all the health worker which is called the family health information system where we collected all the family members details family details household details like um, water and sanitation and we try to compare all the things and we also just see these are all collected in dhs too by the way so we had uh, 6.3 uh, million population data in DHS2. The total population of um, Lao is uh, 6.8. So we had 92 percentage of the coverage in in family health movement system itself. This is the survey which usually was uh, done uh, every year, but during during the COVID, uh, we the Ministry of Health um, didn't uh, do that one because like we had to be locked down. But COVID also helped us because like DHS2. A system was used for building the COVID certificate and that also helped to, to collect 6.2 million record and 30 percent of the record has been verified by the the public itself and rest all the things because of the COVID certificate and COVID vaccination ID so 6.2 million people have the unique COVID certificate ID which can be used across uh, different places so we have all this data now and then civil registration just started and they had 100,000 data. And I said, how best we can try to collaborate. So what we just say, okay, look, we have all the data. We can give it to you. You can verify with your own stream and all the things. And then you can provide uh, the national law ID, which then we will be imported into DHS2. And once we import, people cannot change the ID, the name, the first name, last name, date of birth, and uh, the sex and other few details. So those are part of um, the civil registration system. 
what we will try to do on the birth notification is whenever the birth's happening in DHRS2, it's been recorded. We just send, these are all the information what we'll send it to them. And they will verify and all the things and they will send back the, the things. Um, this is something which is very essential. So Ministry of Health and Ministry of Home Affairs, who's a part, who's dealing the initiative of uh, ECRVS, they have an agreement on like, how do we share the data? First thing is the general things. And then in the, the middle section, there are some, sorry, everything is in Lao. Even I don't understand Lao. But like, I can understand there is something called API, API, API in few places. So what they've been like trying to just say, like, okay, these are all the information which we will be sending to DHRS2. And these are all the information where DHRS2 can send using this API. So it is also at that particular minute level details as how the data exchange is happening. And it has been stamped and signed by the both ministry. So this will allow the technical people of Ministry of Health and Ministry of Home Affairs to work together. So they have a, a broad agreement and at the level down, so then they, they don't have to go and ask every time, oh, can we share this data? Can we share this one? How do we share? So those are all different things has been charted uh, down and we put on things. Similar kind of things, we won't try to do that one in the, in the climate things, but we still don't know how best we can try to use it because the climate stations are in different places. With the WHO initiative, what we've been trying to do is to have few other um, weather station installed in the health center so that like data exchange can happen. And like we've been working with the, uh, the University of Oslo, the, um, the core team on how data can be stored and communicated across and predict things. So that's basically I want to, to have. So we have more time for the discussion. Very well done, John. And everyone, can I call all the presenters up to the to the stage here? Jorn, Jennifer, Prosper, John. You have to go and sit, <laughs> and uh, you you can prepare yourself for some questions. But uh, I will just while you are sitting, maybe starting with uh, with Jennifer because we uh, uh, following up on John's. Uh, John's uh, topic of exchanging data between ministries, that's a challenge, I assume. So could you share some of your, I mean, you have uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, Health. How is that, has that been a challenge in Malawi? Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Yes, uh, for us, it's also a challenge uh, in terms of uh, data sharing uh, when it comes to uh, raw data. Uh, it has been a challenge, uh, but uh, what we do is that when maybe we are, are developing reports, uh, we do invite uh, the, st the stakeholders that we have to work with, informing them what is required. So maybe that can act like a, an MOU between the two ministries. So once the authorizing authority from that ministry authorizes uh, that uh, they can be able to provide that information, we're able to get that information. Yeah, and uh, but most of the times we do work uh, together in different forums, uh, for example, uh, to do with the nutrition uh, aspect. Um, our ministry, we have a department, a department of extension. Uh, we have a section that deals with uh, nutrition intervention in the agriculture sector, but they do work in hand in hand with the Department of Nutrition uh, in the Ministry of Health. So uh, in terms of collaboration and maybe access of information, when we are working in that uh, environment or forum, it, it doesn't create that kind of challenge. But maybe if there is that not collaboration, that's when uh, there is more challenge. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we, we have he he heard now, you know, going from the whole national development plan all the way down to the com uh, community and to the extension workers. It's kind of a, a big span of, 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 uh, of scope. So, um, Jörn, do you want to, to comment? That's not so much tested out on the sharing between uh, animal health and, and uh, human health in, in DRC, but nobody has so far opposed to uh, the idea of a shared uh, dashboard where people are sending data from 
from the one system, HMIs, and the new system into the same dashboard. So it's not uh, so far an issue as far as as far as uh, Edwin can, of course, uh, add to that. But but more important is to in in that case with the, with the, say the agriculture, uh, I mean the Ministry of Agriculture, Fishery, and all that, and 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 the Ministry of Health is to start working together and to work together on on the data. And that's not yet there. And in order for a kind of uh, integrated zoonotic uh, system to to surveillance system to uh, be realized, that is of course important. But uh, also, it's important that uh, the animal health side and learn a bit from from what has been achieved in human health in in order to develop the systems at the at the this uh, peripheral levels and the at the, out in the in the districts and in the province you 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 guys can also ask questions so prepare yourself there is one there but i just want to say one question i have the incentives for the farmers to do animal health it's not really there because they are, you know, they want to you know bring the livestock up. But of course, if a, if an animal dies, it's you know it's an economy. So I think the the the, the institutional practices are super different from the the animal side than the the human health side. So that I guess will be a huge challenge, even though it's impacting a lot and more. I saw a hand. Actually, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the presentations. Um, for from Malawi, the it was really impressive to see that you have three hundred and seventy nine weather stations, and I I was curious as far as uh, I guess just lessons learned, experienced uh, experiences, and um, how you found how you find i guess maintenance and the quality coming from those other stations and, and potentially also maybe from Lao, with you know you recognize this as a as a different you know you have six and you have 18 provinces if you're looking also peaked by this number or if you're looking at uh, google earth engine or i guess uh, what you feel like next steps might be for you thank you Ah, okay, thank you. So in terms of uh, maintenance and uh, data, quarter, uh, data quality, uh, so for us, uh, the system in terms of data quality checks is that once the extension workers uh, uh, collect the, any data at community level, uh, the one who is heading them or the coordinator, and we are calling it at EPA level, that's extension planning area, You're the ones who coordinate uh, Akasha activity, yeah, uh, is the one who is responsible in terms of data validation. So we go through stages of data validation before it's utilized uh, by the ministry or even accessed by the Department of Meteorological Services. So in terms of the weather stations, the way they are is that some of the weather stations, they're automated. So the Department of Mates, they are the ones that receive directory uh, the uh, weather information directly from the automated stations, but some of the stations are not automated, so they have to wait uh, for the extension workers to collect uh, that information and uh, be able to share with uh, the Department of Meteorological Services. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just on the on the law side, like it's um, yeah, we looked at the, the Google Earth engine and tried to get the, the weather data, but Lao does not really have so much there. So like we we even looked at the, the because it takes the average things right and it takes from the different the points of the weather data and then it's not so accurate so that has been one of the the, the challenge so um, what the 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 WHO and the Ministry of Health will trying to are trying to do is to buy a few weather station data and install it in different places and we looked at a few of the devices it's not so expensive and it can directly send the data to the server and we can get the both the rainfall data and the the, um, the climate data uh, into the system. And then like we can just see how best we can try to use it, utilize it. That's what we've been trying to focus on. So average is not a good thing when it's come to climate data, actually. Temperature is the peaks. Uh, down and up. Uh, um. uh, 
Thank you for the presentation. I think for the uh, for Malawi and Kenya um, and the yeah, see, I think it's it will be very good to to learn more about you know how the, the use of the data at the community and the, the sub you know, the, the yeah the community level. But then my also particular interest is for the lab presentations um, on the CRVSI. Um, so we are pushing the data into the CRVS, but what would be the use of the CRVS data back into um, into the the the, the the health the data as part of the analytics um, and the, the products of the system. Thanks, and so um, just to, to address on the law first, and then I can give the, the mic to Yom to answer on the, the zoonotic one. Uh, with the CRVS, what we just told that, like from the Ministry of Health side, all the births and all the deaths, whatever it is collected in DHRS2, we will send the notification to them. We are just sending only the notification with given the, the ID numbers and all different things. And what um, the Ministry of Home Affairs with the HERA system will give is all the deaths happen in the villages. So that will be pushed into to DHRS2. So we are giving the notification, they will confirm it and then give the, the national ID on the death side. So whatever deaths happen in the hospital, we are going to share with them. And whatever the village death happened, we will share it back. But the challenge is in DHRS2, our org unit is the facility the hospital and all things in the crvs it's only districts and villages so when they th these are the different things the challenge which we need to try to 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 take care but in lao instance villages is also part of um, uh, lao uh, dhs to organ so it was easier to to transfer the data between ecrvs and dhs to Lessons from the human part of, of the information system, HMIS, uh, is of course that you need to feed the information back and get interest around the information at, at uh, as local level as possible in order to to move forward. And I think that is one of the not one of the lessons from from uh, the general uh, uh, human information system that we need to. To, to give to the animal health side that even though it's not necessarily achieved everywhere in HMIS, et cetera, but if you're not being able to give data that are interesting at, I mean, for farmers, for example, when it comes to animal health, then, then uh, they would, it will be no progress anywhere. And that is also the reason why uh, we are saying that Ah, we need to include other indicators, not only the zoonotic diseases, because the farmers may be more interested in uh, in in, uh, in the diseases that are affecting their economy and uh, livestock and uh, that kind of things than necessarily that kind of speciality of of uh, on transmission between animals and and uh, humans. So. So to strengthen the more more generally the the information system in animals is probably the best way forward to also get the early warning and and uh, health security surveillance uh, that we are interested in from the other side. Then. So give data back to the people is is important and the data that they want or need. We have a quite big uh, spam from animal health to monitoring the SDGs uh, across sector, I would say. But however, cross sector. Um, um, so, uh, Prosper, you were presenting both from the National Development Plan, but also down to the Rwanda, even though that's uh, Andrew's topic and Adolf and, and team. Um, have you seen the, uh, any of the incentives to actually utilizing the data on a different level than the national, you know, at the national? How low can you go with those data? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, in all the implementations we, we've seen, the most incentive that um, most of these uh, use, I mean, most of these implementations go with uh, um, funding. So they are resources attached to, you know, the, in, the, the, in, the, the, the innovation, I mean, the, the implementation that are happening at both national level, uh, district level, and then village level. So you will find uh, a lot of need to report. I think the reporting, um, we, we had one question, which was about, you know, how, how do we 
uh, get these sectors to all report. So one of the incentives that as you report your data, you are getting um, more funding. So it's like mm. results almost based financing. But also the, there is also um, uh, a competition that is among this because there's a lot of comparison between one village to another village as you are doing your reporting. So this data is available at different levels. We've seen in Rwanda, it used to be on you know boards where people go and read, but now you have it on the dashboard or you can even have it on the, on the phone. So the more incentive is um, the team being able to see that they are you know being counted and also the, the reporting comes with more funding as you uh, as as you are as you are implementing. Thank you. Any questions from the audience to this distinguished panel? Oh, but, but sorry, yeah. you can. Kristen almost asked my question, but um, this is to Prosper on Uganda specifically. I can imagine that the level of integration you've achieved in Uganda is actually quite impressive and very expensive. Do you think Uganda is at a place where this is now institutionalized, where if the European Union doesn't fund it, there is enough value that's been seen. I mean, the president has a dashboard um, that the government will continue to fund this because they see the importance and how critical this data is for the economy. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, that's one of the, you know, um, the, the 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 big thing that we look out in into implementation, especially in the governments, uh, really uh, looking at sustainability, not only just having a good use case that can be able to, you know, showcase in a conference or whatever, but with people really using this system. So the beauty around Uganda implementation is that um, the system has been in place. Uh, whether it has been, you know, it's been more of Excel spreadsheets. So people have been reporting with, uh, you know, Excel and uh, the, the office of the prime minister go through all these Excels to look at the different sectors and they generate a report. But um, the, the, the biggest incentives is for them being able to, you know, as first from the office of the prime minister, which is managing this, being able to manage data very well, you know, having a robust system that can be able to give them uh, longitudinal data. But, but also for the other sectors also being able to have a place where they can be able to go online and look at their data. So that's one of the biggest incentives that is really pulling this. Then um, there have been also structures of this reporting in those ministries, different ministries, they have they have structures of who is reporting, when to report, and the deadlines and so on. So that's that structure is already there. So this platform is already is is is, is already finding some comfort in the implementation. Yeah, so um, the European, of course, uh, Union has uh, the, the contract they had with with us to support this ended is ending this month, and that's why we uh, they have actually asked us to have an MOU where we can be able to keep you know supporting them as as we keep moving. But we really see that uh, they're also thinking of you know in the next financial year, which is beginning this year, to put a budget that will cater for you know the maintenance of the system. It's being governed, hosted by the um, by the national um, uh, national. Uh, data warehouse so that's where it's hosted so there's no cost to the hosting but also the budget that they are planning in and they have actually asked us you know like what kind of implementation needs do we need like trainings regular trainings and uh, uh, system upgrade and so that so there is a, a, a really good um, a great willingness to be able to support it moving forward thank you thank you uh, any other question from the audience if not, I have one. Uh, I can take it more generally, but uh, hinting at agriculture, <laughs> Jennifer. Um, we have seen in education that uh, the appetite for having better data system for analytics are coming from ministries when they look to health that have better. Have you seen any of the same? Has that what has been a driving force from agriculture? to use DHS2. It's not a leading question, you know, it's not. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether this kind of appetite for, for data has kind of spread or diffused through through the, you know, pandemic or or, or the, the, the quality or the more data, as we have seen in education, the, not jealousy, but, you know, a bit of envy and, and com competition between health and education, Jennifer. Yes, so for us in the ministry, I think before 
the improves the start of the uh, dynamic system there is always has been interest in um, agricultural data by different uh, stakeholders that we work with but i think the challenges that we were having then was that in terms of having uh, timely data having a database where uh, the information is consolidated so with uh, the introduction of the system in the sector it has uh, gained interest uh, with the donors and gain interest with academia, the research institutions, uh, the students uh, that use uh, Akasha information uh, for different uh, reports and also generating uh, different policies. Uh, and also there is an interest uh, where by now we want to be using further the household registration for different interventions, uh, maybe also including uh, the subsidy program uh, that we implement uh, in the ministry. So. Yeah, for this uh, system, I think uh, it will provide uh, whereby accessibility, easy accessibility of information uh, before, uh, rather than that before when we, it was a challenge for one to have access uh, to our crash uh, data. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we have one question online. So the question is for all of you. Uh, in any of the countries we are using DHS2 for cross-sector, do you have any data sharing policy? That's a question. Yeah, no, like it's um, on the love side, like we have within within the ministry, um, Minister of Home Affairs. Uh, hello, can you hear me? So in Lao, like we have the things with the Minister of Home Affairs and Ministry of um, uh, Health. So the, there, like we have a clear cut uh, data sharing agreement. What data can be pushed, and also what are all the different fields that uh, um, uh, Minister of Home Affairs is collecting for the births and the deaths and what are the different fields which DHIS2 is collecting. So they are also including few of the data which they want Minister of Health to collect so that they can produce. So there is, it's not only yeah, agreement on the data sharing, but also on the metadata side and all. So that's uh, is been there between two ministry with the Ministry of uh, Natural uh, Resources and the Environment. We are just starting. So where we are pulling the data from there, but I'm not quite sure what data we will give back to them. So right now we are just like only pulling the data of the climate and the things uh, from from these weather stations, but not not much uh, what what we can are uh, giving back to them. That's from from Lao side. In Kenya, there is an agreement between Ministry of Health and uh, and uh, the Climate uh, Meteorological uh, Agency, whatever that is called, uh, on sharing of climate data and health data. That is uh, something we, when we had the meeting uh, in the Ministry of Health in Kenya, we were informed about. And they are actually launching uh, initiatives around climate and health. Mm. And we'll have a big uh, conference later in the year. So very focused on that sharing. Talking, we're just uh, commenting while before you, Jennifer. So, so uh, <laughs> World Meteorological Organization are um, advocating for open data. So that's kind of in the era of, of sharing, but in practice, of course, different, Jennifer. Yes, uh, for us, Mala, we also have a data sharing policy uh, that is being uh, managed uh, by the uh, Department of E-Government under the Ministry of Information. So as the government entities, we are able to utilize uh, that policy. And also we have uh, the National Statistical Office. Uh, that's, they are the ones also who coordinates and oversee all the data statistics uh, that uh, are collected uh, in the uh, government uh, sectors. Yeah, so we have uh, that policy. Thank you. Um, um, I, I will put uh, my commissioner from Minister of Education of, of Health from Uganda on a spot uh, to help me with this. But I, I, for in terms of data sharing, but I know uh, Uganda has had an initiative, so I may, I'll ask Dr. Sarah to comment a little bit on data sharing across sectors. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prosper. I think uh, data sharing across uh, sectors in Uganda is something that is being promoted, especially under the current National Development Plan framework that Prosper presented. 
And uh, this is to align all sectors towards uh, ensuring that uh, we achieve the vision 2040 or the development plan goals. And uh, we are using the program-based approach uh, to planning and also to performance monitoring. So we all have indicators and uh, this is to enable sectors to move from being uh, implementing as silos, but uh, like for example, the health, the human capital development program is comprised of three sectors, health, education, and uh, gender and social development. So on a quarterly basis, we actually have to show cause on how the human capital development program has contributed to the achievement of the national development goal. So we have an M and E framework where we have to look at all these indicators and see the performance. So we must know how education is performing, gender and social development and health, and we are assessed as a program uh, towards this achievement. And this is done through the office of the prime minister as the officer of government. So I think that is the, the sharing. Then instead of having one sector information system, we are now opening up to see how we all contribute to the goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just a short question to Mulawi. I'm from Pakistan. Do you have uh, any plan to actually uh, study the impact of the weather on the incidence of the disease in future? The impact of the weather on uh, incidence of different diseases in your areas. Are we studied? Sorry. Uh... Ah, okay, yes. Uh, yeah, we have plans on how we can assess the impact of uh, climate on uh, uh, different diseases, including the uh, animal diseases. Uh, that's why we are saying that we have started uh, with the climate information. And also, we are also looking, we also have a module on the animal health. And at, in the future, what we want to do is to link these two modules and be able to assess on how one module, one data contributes uh, to the other uh, data set. Uh, for example, how climate is affecting or impacting a disease outbreak on livestock. Yeah. So that's where we are going. Yeah. Thank you. That is the last word from this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, thank you so much. A big hand. And we have we have a coffee break, but please come back sharp because we have then a very very exciting uh, plenary again uh, with uh, looking back, looking forward for DHS2 to become an innovative platform, and we will have presentation by Lars Austin and again a distinguished panel. Okay, see you all.